Hello again from Access. This is Jennifer Gibson, your presenter today. We're going to be covering part eight of our 12 part series called Navigating the Highway of ICD 10 CM. Today we're going to focus on neoplasm coding, and as usual, we'll be covering some objectives, which you see here. We want to learn why the proper coding is important, first of all. We also want to learn who's responsible for applying and assigning those diagnoses. And then we're going to study the guidance for coding neoplasms in ICD-10. And then we'll apply the knowledge that we've learned to some common home health scenarios. In each of these webinar series presentations, we like to briefly go over who actually selects the diagnoses and the uh, guidance behind that theory. Um, just bear in mind that if you want more intense and in-depth information on the guidance and the guidelines and conventions and also the uh, guidance for the OASIS, you'll need to go back to our first in the 12-part series because that's where that's covered in depth. Um, but we're going to briefly go over who selects the diagnoses according to CMS guidance. And according to that OASIS C1 guidance manual, the selection of primary and secondary diagnoses must be made by the assessing clinician. Now the clinician is expected to understand that patient's overall medical condition and care needs before selecting the diagnoses. So part of what we do when we go in a patient's home, of course, is to get an overall view of what's going on with our patient. Why were they referred to home health? What other comorbid conditions might they have? Um, what are the challenges to meeting the patient's needs, if any? And how are we going to go ahead and make sure that that happens, that we're um, teaching and training or delivering the care that we need to? So all of that is expected to be known by that assessing clinician and translated onto the OASIS and the plan of care. Having said that, the diagnoses that are chosen are based on that clinician's assessment findings, the medical record documentation, and input from the physician. And sometimes we even have to query and get more input from the physician after having gone out to see the patient. So all of that's an important process and why we want to talk about that. Now let's talk a little bit more about who is going to actually record those diagnoses. Again, according to the OASIS C1 guidance manual, that assessing clinician should be the person who records the primary and secondary diagnoses on the OASIS in M1021 and 1023. And also, you know, to put those diagnoses down on any medical changes that have happened to the patient uh, or any inpatient diagnoses as well. All of that is the responsibility of the assessing clinician to figure that out and add it to the OASIS. Now, the clinician may not know the actual ICD-10 code that should go in the code box. And according to the OASIS guidance, the coder can actually add the code itself. But as far as sequencing and placing those diagnoses titles, that's up to the clinician who assessed the patient. Now, if you're going to be the clinician doing that, you need to know what criteria um, to have for that primary and secondary diagnosis. And so in the primary diagnosis spot, that diagnosis should be the one that's most related to the current plan of care. And if there are more than one diagnosis being treated, then the diagnosis that's listed primary should be the one that represents the most acute condition and requires the most services. That should be your primary diagnosis. In other words, it's the chief reason for home health. It requires the most intensive skilled services and it's not a Z code unless absolutely necessary. And sometimes you will have Z codes that are necessary. For example, we're going to talk about in our next presentation, part nine, a scenario where that actually happens. But for example, if you have uh, a patient who has surgery to correct a condition and there are no complications after that surgery, um, say they had a knee replacement because of osteoarthritis and the knee replacement took care of osteoarthritis, you would have aftercare uh, as your primary diagnosis if there are no complications of the surgery. And then you might list osteoarthritis in the inpatient facility diagnosis. And also you might list it over in 1025B because it's now a resolved condition, that osteoarthritis. But the Z code itself would go in 1021A, for example. 
All right, so let's talk about the secondary diagnoses. When you're selecting a secondary diagnosis or diagnoses, there's criteria to consider as well. And that criteria is as follows. These diagnoses did not meet criteria for primary diagnosis. So they're not the main reason for care, but there are reasons that we need to go in and see the patient. Now, the diagnoses in the secondary listing are also addressed in the plan of care and or they affect the patient's responsiveness to treatment and rehab. And so any other diagnosis other than what's in the primary spot, we're going to sequence those based on acuity and or coding guidance, okay? So let's keep that in mind. Now we list those diagnoses in best order that reflects the seriousness of that patient's condition and to justify the disciplines and the services provided. So now that we know who's going to assign the diagnoses names and then the codes, let's also now talk about some general coding guidelines. When you're trying to code, you need to always start in the alphabetic index of your code book. Now when you're in the alphabetic index, sometimes you'll see a dash at the end of the entries there, and that just means that additional characters are going to be needed to complete that code. And by the way, you can't find a complete code in most um, scenarios in the alphabetic index. You should always double check in the tabular. Now in the alphabetic index, not only will you sometimes see a dash at the end of the entry, but you might also see an entry that says C or C also. Now take that as a command and not as a suggestion when you see that, because often there will be additional information or better information at the alternate entry that it's referring you to. So make sure if you see C or C also listed that you do exactly that and flip over and look at a different entry in your alphabetic index. Now once you've found a code in the alphabetic index, the next step in the process is to flip over to the tabular index, which is the chapters part of your code book, and you're going to double check that code in the tabular section. Now once you've gone over and found that code in the tabular section, you you want to check for guidance that you might find in all different places. The first place to look is chapter level. So when you get to say chapter 11, at the very beginning of that chapter, there may or may not be guidance that tells you to do certain things to every code in that chapter. Once you've checked for guidance at the chapter level, you'll also want to check on the chapter block level. Chapter blocks are, are simply parts of the code book where things are classified that are similarly uh, diagnosed or have similar characteristics. For example, if you look in the circulatory chapter under I-10 through I-15, those are all hypertensive diseases. And so at the chapter block level, you may very well have guidance that would apply to all of the codes in that chapter block from I-10 to I-15. The next place you'll need to look for guidance is at the three character category level, such as I-12 uh, for hypertensive chronic kidney disease. There may be guidance at that I-12 three character category level that applies to all I-12 codes. So at that final code level, you may also have information such as which character to place in the seventh position or to code first or use additional code, for example. That may be what you find at the final code level. Okay, so let's talk about where we find neoplasm codes first of all. In your code books, coding for neoplasms will actually start in the alpha index and or the neoplasm table. Now, and the reason I say that, the neoplasm table is separate from your alphabetic index. So if you have a histological term for the neoplasm, you want to start there with the alphabetical index. If you don't have a histological term, you're going to start with the neoplasm table. So bear that in mind. Let's talk about where to find the neoplasm table next. It's found just after the alphabetic index. Um, and when you get to the neoplasm table, you'll notice that on the neoplasm table, the rows on the left are the locations and types of neoplasms, such as bone, cancer, whatever. Then the columns across the top that go left to right, those define the type of neoplasm and if it's a primary or secondary site, for example. 
Okay, so let's look at the neoplasm table example that you have here. This is not exactly how it looks in your book, but it's very similar. Again, on the left-hand side, you'll notice it says neoplasm or neoplastic, and then you have a site such as the breast in this area. Uh, then you have specific parts of the breast listed after the first entry. Now, as you go across the table from left to right, you'll see the first column is for a malignant neoplasm primary site. The second column is malignant neoplasm secondary, then cancer in situ, benign, uncertain behavior, and unspecified behavior. So all of those are different categories that this neoplasm might fall in. So the first thing you want to do is find out if it's malignant or one of the other different types of of categories. That's why I say check the histological term first if you have that because often that will tell you, okay? If it's called cancer, you know that's malignancy and then depending on what is documented, that may or may not be a primary or secondary site. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Now, the very first code that you see, what the yellow arrow is pointing at, if all you knew is that this is a malignant neoplasm of the breast. When those two columns intersect, as they do here with the yellow arrow, that C50.9, the fir first code listed at that category is a default code. In other words, that's just the generic, don't know much about it, that's a default. And then as you go down that malignant primary column, you'll see that as the information is more specific as to site, those codes change. Anytime you see a 0.9, that's usually going to be an unspecified code. Whereas these individual sites are like 0 0.0, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, and so on and so forth. Now, you'll also notice with the uh, red circle here, if you knew that this was breast cancer of the lower inner quadrant and it's a malignant primary lesion, that code would be C50.3. You'll also notice there's a dash, which means we have to add something to this code. It's not a complete code. So this is kind of what your neoplasm table will look like in your code book and how to use it. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about coding neoplasms properly. Let's talk a bit more about that histological term now, when you're looking up a histological term, those are examples such as adenoma or glioblastoma or neuroma. These are typically uh, names of a specific type of neoplasm. When you have a term like that, you want to look that up in the alphabetic index first because the alphabetic index will tell you if this is a malignancy or if it's benign or if it's a CA in situ and so on and so forth. So that's where you'll start. Once you have that information, then you'll go to your neoplasm table and find the actual code. So let's look at a histological term example. Let's say the physician records and your referral states the patient has neuroma. The first thing you're going to do is look up neuroma in the alphabetical index. And it's listed as this. And you'll see that this is only a partial example, but let's pretend this is our code book. You would see neuroma, and then in parentheses it would say, see also neoplasm nerve benign. Okay, and then if you knew that it was on the acoustic nerve or an amputation site, you would go to one of those codes. But even though you knew that, you would also go ahead and look at the C also neoplasm nerve benign. And the reason that we say that is because by looking it up in the alphabetic index, we now see that a neuroma is a benign neoplasm and not a malignant neoplasm. That lets you know to look for nerve on the left side of the neoplasm table and then the benign column at the top. And depending on where the nerve is, where those two codes intersect, that's going to be how you find your code. So let's look at it on the table. We look at nerve on the left. And that's all we know. We don't know exactly where it is in this case. Then you're going to go all the way over until you see benign in the columns. And where those two intersect, you have code D36.10. Now, once I have that, I'm going to jot it down and flip over in the tabular section to D36.10. And we're going to look for guidance, like we said, in the chapter level, we're going to look for guidance. We're going to look for guidance in the chapter block level. Then we're going to look in the three character category, D36. And then we're going to look at the final code, D36.10, for any kind of guidance for sequencing and other matters.
All right, so speaking of sequencing, let's talk a little bit about how we sequence neoplasms next. A primary neoplasm means that that's the area of the body where the neoplasm first occurred. Whereas a secondary neoplasm means metastasis. These are the areas of the body where the first listed neoplasm has spread. So in other words, if the physician documents breast cancer with liver mets, we see that quite often, that means the cancer started in the breast and then it metastasized or spread into the liver. When you're coding and sequencing neoplasms in home health care, you have to think about what is your focus of care. If the neoplasm itself is the focus of care, it should be sequenced first. If your focus of care is the primary site, then the primary site is coded first. However, if the focus of care is a secondary site only, you code the secondary site first and then the primary site. Okay, so that again, that makes sense in so much as sequencing for neoplasms is strictly guided by what is your focus of care. Now, if you have neoplasms that overlap sites, if a primary malignant neoplasm overlaps two or more contiguous or sites that are next to each other, those sites should be classified to a subcategory C34.8, and that's an overlapping lesion code. Now, unless that combination is specifically indexed somewhere else, then you need to use this code to show that that neoplasm is overlapping two sites that are side by side. For example, if you have tumors overlapping quadrants in the right lung, that diagnosis code would be C34.82, malignant neoplasm of overlapping sites of the right bronchus and lung. All right, let's say that the patient has neoplasms in multiple sites. If you have multiple neoplasms of the same site that are contiguous, but they're not overlapping, then you're going to code each of those sites separately, and then you sequence according to the focus of care. For example, if the patient had tumors in different quadrants of the same breast, on the left side, lower inner quadrant and lower outer quadrant, but they're not overlapping, in other words, there's not a lesion sitting right there on the midline between the uh, upper and lower quadrant, then you would code those in, in both areas. And then the example we have here, you would have C50.312, malignant neoplasm of lower inner quadrant left female breast, and C50.512, malignant neoplasm of lower outer quadrant left female breast. However, if there was just one tumor sitting right in the middle of those two spots, then you would go back and do the contiguous sites. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Let's also talk about neoplasm complications. So we've talked about how to sequence the neoplasms themselves, what happens if it's in an overlapping site, and what happens if there's multiple lesions in the same site but they don't overlap. Now let's talk about complications as well. Now if a complication is associated with the neoplasm and the focus of care is the complication, you're going to follow the, the guidelines you see here. Number one, if the complication is anemia and that anemia is associated with the malignancy and the treatment is only directed at the anemia, you're going to code the malignancy first and then the anemia. And that has to be documented as anemia due to the malignancy. If the patient has anemia that's associated with chemotherapy or immunotherapy or radiation therapy or a combination of all of those and treatment is only for the anemia, in that case, you code the anemia first and then the neoplasm and then the appropriate code for adverse effects of anti-neoplastic drug. And you'll get that from the table of drugs and chemicals, which follows the neoplasm table. And we're going to cover that table of drugs and chemicals in one of the last couple of um, webinars that we do. The third point here, if the, if the uh, complication is dehydration due to malignancy and only dehydration is being treated, in, the, in other words, you're giving IV rehydration, which is likely not going to be a Medicare patient, but it might very well be private insurance. 
Um, in that case, you would code dehydration first and then your code for the malignancy. So again, remember your coding is really t talking about and painting a picture of what is the primary reason I'm here. So if the primary reason that you're there is dehydration, dehydration goes first. If the primary reason you're there is the malignancy, that goes first. And if it's anemia due to chemotherapy, of course, that goes first. Now, if the treatment of a complication that resulted from surgery is part of the reason for the encounter, then the complication goes first, and then the malignancy and so on. For example, if you have a dehist surgical incision following mastectomy for breast cancer of the right breast, the dehiscence goes first because you're there to treat that complication before the actual breast cancer. So dehiscence is first, then the breast cancer in that case. All right, so now let's talk about what happens, speaking of surgery, when the surgery has happened and they've excised the neoplasm. When do you stop coding neoplasms and start coding it as a history of? Thankfully, there's guidance to tell us that. So when the primary malignancy has been previously excised and eradicated from the site and there's no further treatment directed to that site and there's no evidence of any existing primary malignancy that's when you can code personal history of malignant neoplasm to indicate a former site of malignancy. But again, there has to be an excision. It has to be eradicated. There's no more treatment. There's no more evidence of any existing primary malignancy before you can code it as personal history of. Now, if the treatment of the neoplasm itself is the focus of care for your episode or your encounter, um, and you're going there to administer chemotherapy or immunotherapy in the home, you're going to sequence the correct code from category Z51, which is a status code. That would be your primary diagnosis. So if you're only there to provide chemotherapy for the neoplasm, then you're going to code Z51.11, encounter for anti-neoplastic chemotherapy. That would be first. Then the next code would be which kind of neoplasm they have. That would go and so on and so forth. Um, if you're there for the anti-neoplastic immunotherapy, that would be Z51.12, followed by the appropriate neoplasm codes. So what about neoplasm-related pain? That's a frequent complication so we need to know how we're going to code that as well. If the only reason or the primary reason that you're in the home to take care of that patient for the 60-day episode or the period of time for the encounter is pain control or pain management only, so in that case, you're going to code G89.3 as your primary diagnosis, which is neoplasm-related pain. Then you would have uh, neoplasm of bone, secondary site, because that's the metastasis site. And then you would sequence neoplasm of the lung, if that's where the lung cancer began, that would be your third diagnosis, because the pain is related to the metastasis site and not the primary. All right, however, when the reason for the encounter is management of the neoplasm and related pain and control management, you code the neoplasms first, and then you code the pain, okay? So maybe this patient is more along the lines of the patient who's not ready for hospice yet. They haven't come to terms uh, with the fact that they're terminal, or maybe they're still getting chemo, and you're treating the neoplasms and the pain. You're going to do the neoplasms first, and then the neoplasm-related pain code. Let's talk a minute about neoplasm-related fractures. Now, this is one of two categories of pathologic fractures in ICD-10. You have the neoplasm-related fractures, and then you have the fractures that are due to osteoporosis. So if a fracture is related to the neoplasm itself, that's considered a pathological fracture. And if your focus of care is that fracture, then you're going to code from subcategory M84.5, pathologic fracture and neoplastic disease. And that would be sequenced first if you're there for the fracture. Then you would follow that by the appropriate neoplasm code or codes and make sure that you pay attention to the guidance at the M84.5 category. All right, so we've talked about the neoplasm related guidance. Now let's hit the track and practice some of what we've learned so that we can give some good examples, okay? In your first scenario, your patient is a 69-year-old female patient who has malignant neoplasm of the right breast 
lower outer quadrant with metastasis to the left lower lung. The patient has received two rounds of chemotherapy, but developed anemia requiring a blood transfusion. She was referred to home health for continued care of anemia upon hospital discharge. So, in this case, the anemia is due to the chemotherapy. And since we're there to treat the anemia, that would be the first listed code. So your M item 1021A should be D64.81, anemia due to antineoplastic chemotherapy. And this is where in the early guidance we talked about the OASIS. As a field clinician, I might not know that code is D64.81, but I would know that it's anemia due to chemotherapy. I may not know the exact code title even, but I have enough knowledge to know the main reason we're there is anemia due to the chemotherapy. And that's what I should list. And then the coder would put in the D64.81 for me. Okay, the second answer in this case, we're going to have to put what's causing the patient to receive chemotherapy, and that's going to be C50.511, malignant neoplasm of lower outer quadrant of right female breast. You'll notice in your neoplasm coding that you have laterality. You'll also notice for breast cancer, you have male and female breast. So that's why this code gets much longer. C50.511 is second listed. The third listed code is C78.02, secondary malignant neoplasm of left lung. That means it's metastasized to the lung. And that code is C78.02. And then last, we're going to code the adverse effect of the chemotherapy. And to do that, you have to go onto your drug table. You'll find the antineoplastic drug listed on the left and on the top going across from left to right you'll find the adverse effect column and where those two intersect you should have a code that you'll double check in the tabular and the code turns out to be T45.1x5d we put D for subsequent encounter because home health is continuing to take care of this anemia uh, it may or may not be incorrect to put an A initial encounter as well if this is the first time she's ever been treated for this anemia. D means this is a subsequent treatment episode. All right, let's look at practice scenario number two. The patient in this case is a 72-year-old male with malignant neoplasm of the stomach fundus region, which is causing anemia. He's been referred to home health for continued treatment of anemia. So again, you have to ask yourself these questions. What's causing the anemia? And you may not have a clear picture. You might have to query. In this case, the neoplasm itself is causing the anemia. So how do we code that? In this case, the neoplasm goes first, C16.1, followed by D63.0. And you'll notice if you're checking for guidance in each of those places we talked about earlier, there's guidance at D63.0 that tells you to code first the neoplasm. And this one's kind of a tricky one. And the reason I wanted to put it into the scenarios and to the training is because quite often this will happen. You'll think the main reason I'm here is anemia, and you'll list that, especially if you're using a lookup off the internet or you're doing a, a Mac or a gym or something like that. Whereas if you're actually using the code book and learning how to look for guidance, you'll see the guidance that tells you that the malignant neoplasm must go first. So that's, again, just a way to reemphasize that yes, learning to code properly using your code book is the way to go. Those mappings and gems and all that stuff, they can lead you wrong because they do not have the guidance built in. All right, let's look at scenario number three. In scenario number three, your patients refer to the Home Health Agency for Management of Pain related to neoplasm of the bone and kidney, which are both metastatic sites from breast cancer of the right upper quadrant of the right breast. The patient had a mastectomy over a year ago and is still receiving chemotherapy, and treatment is for pain management only. So we're there for pain management only. In this case, because we're only there to manage the patient's pain, G89.3 is the primary reason for home care. That next code would be where the pain is coming from. We're going to sequence based on acuity. 
and list in the uh, order of the services that we're giving the patient. So for that reason, C79.51, although that's a metastasis site, the secondary malignant neoplasm of the bone is where the pain is coming from. That goes first followed by C79.00, secondary malignant neoplasm of unspecified kidney and renal pelvis, followed by C50.44, primary malignant neoplasm of upper quadrant of right female breast. And then we have to code a status code for the mastectomy, and that code is Z90.11, acquired absence of right breast and nipple. Okay, scenario number four, your patient's referred to home health for treatment of a recent exacerbation of acute on chronic systolic heart failure. The patient also has a history of lung cancer, which was removed with surgical lobectomy five years ago. No further treatments were required. He also needs physical therapy due to weakness from the hospital stay and his circulatory issues. So how are we going to code this gentleman? We first have an acute on chronic systolic congestive heart failure. That's a combination code. That's I-50.23. The correct weakness code in this case is R-53.1. And this is a symptom code. um, And it is the one, according to guidance, that we use when a patient has generalized weakness, not true muscle weakness, but generalized weakness from circulatory or respiratory type issues, chronic problems, That's this patient perfectly, and that's why we chose R53.1. Now, he had um, his neoplasm, his cancer has already been eradicated. There's no further treatment. So for that reason, we have Z85.118, personal history of other malignant neoplasm of the bronchus and lung. And then we also have to code uh, for them taking that lobe out of his lung, Uh, Z90.2 is the code for acquired absence of lung, and you'll see inclusionary terms that tell you even if it's only part of the lung, this is still the correct code. All right, so in conclusion, thank you very much for attending our ICD-10 coding webinar series. I hope you learned how to code neoplasms today. If you have more information, feel free to contact me. My contact information is here. You have a phone number with my extension. That number is 214-575-7711, extension 3917. My email, which is probably the best way to reach me as I travel quite a lot, that email is jgibson at access.com. And you'll see I am coding and OASIS certified, so feel free to reach out to me if you have questions regarding either of those, okay? And I appreciate you being with us today at Access about the neoplasm coding. Our next series will, uh, or I should say our next webinar in the series will cover GI and GU coding. And we hope that you'll stay tuned and, and tune in for that one as well. Thank you again for everything that you do for these patients that you care for. We know that no matter what your job title might be, If you weren't there to do your job each day, those patients would not be cared for. So thank you very much for what you do every day to ensure that the patients who deserve the care get the care they want where they want to be, and that's in the home. Okay, have a wonderful and blessed day, and we will see you again next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining our webinar today. We know that your time is valuable and are happy you chose to spend it with access. At Access, we're proud to offer a variety of training resources to keep you in the know on industry news and updates. You can register for additional trainings and watch on-demand training videos through our software or at access.com, where you can also find tutorials, online manuals, and answers to frequently asked questions. We're always just a call or click away. Feel free to call us at 866-795-5990 or email us at support at access.com. All of our expert client experience representatives have a home health care background. They've been in your shoes and know the industry inside and out. Join the conversation and connect with us on our social channels. We'll keep you up to date with what's going on in the industry and share resources to help you grow your business and improve your patient outcomes. Thank you again for your time today and for choosing Access, your provider of complete home health care services, software, and solutions.